Hello everyone, we're back. MassCom 101, quick and dirty PowerPoint lectures. On to chapter seven, audio. This is kind of an odd chapter in that it combines really two kind of different mass media. Uh, the recording industry, you know, records and so forth, and the radio industry. Well, I, I, I think your author, Ralph Hansen, is right in that it is all audio, but especially in the uh, history portion, it means there's going to be a lot of switching back and forth. All right, let's get to it. Let's begin with uh, uh, the beginning of the recording business. Thomas Edison, a uh, famous inventor, he, he, he's become increasingly controversial in recent years. How, how much he really invented, well, you know, who knows. Uh, in 1877, he invented a sound recording system. He saw it as being a natural for uh, office dictation. Uh, he came up with a device where you could have cylinders made out of foil or wax and the grooves in them would create sound. Now especially with the wax cylinders you could smooth it over and re-record. Kind of a slick little machine in its own way. A little more than a decade later Emil Berliner uh, developed a device, called it the gramophone, and it played music on flat discs. Now, the advantage of the gramophone was that playtime was longer and sound quality was better. So, you know, when you think about why the gramophone won, it's how are people going to use the machine? If it really had become an office dictation machine, Edison would have won. But as we know what happened, it became a home entertainment device. So Berliner's gramophone won out. Now, those are not the only uh, innovations in the world of, uh, of recording. In 1958, there was stereo. Uh, really quite a huge innovation. Uh, made uh, recorded music sound a lot better. Well, let's talk about uh, the beginnings of radio. You know, radio didn't really begin as radio. It began as a thing called wireless. And what wireless was, was the telegraph without wires. So. You know, I think we have to back all the way up to the telegraph. Samuel Morse uh, really revolutionized communication. The idea of having short pulses called dots and longer pulses called dashes that allowed Morse to send coded messages that could be easily decoded at the other end, uh, could send them you know, thousands of miles uh, almost instantly. Just a magical device. Now, Guglielmo Marconi, uh, Italian by birth, uh, lived his adult life in the United States. Marconi, in 1896, uh, built on some German uh, uh, theoretical research and was able to send a wireless signal, uh, I believe it was one mile across New York Harbor. And this was the beginning of wireless technology. Now, I'm hoping that if I live to be 500 or so years old, I'll be able to do MassCom 101 time travel field trips. And I gotta tell you, if we ever get to do that, I'm taking you to Christmas Eve 1905. Reginald Fessenden was demonstrating his vacuum tube. He had taken a wireless transmitter and he had uh, improved it with this tube, which allowed it to transmit more than just dots and dashes. It could now transmit voice. 
So Fessenden decided to uh, demonstrate his discovery by going to the top of a tall building in New York uh, with a Victrola, a hand-cranked record player, and play Christmas music into the transmitter. Now you'd say, well, gee, you know, who, who had a radio in 1905? Well, um, wireless was for maritime communication, ship to ship, ship to shore. So radio operators in the harbor, perhaps with their headphones on, suddenly started hearing traditional Christmas music. Some of them thought they were hearing the voices of angels. This is the first glimmer that wireless could become a thing called radio and could be used for mass communication. David Sarnoff was a brilliant guy. Earlier in his career, he was uh, an executive with the American Marconi Company. Uh, later on, he became uh, the head of NBC. And his music box memo is remarkable. In 1915, radio as we know it did not exist yet. But he was able to predict in this letter uh, what this emerging medium could be used for. I mean, think about it. Radio is a mass communication tool for news. Okay, it does that today. Music? Oh, yes. And sports. Now, please note this graphic here. Not everyone saw the brilliance of Sarnoff's music box memo. This slide is going to sound a little bit insane. Uh, radio technology in the United States moved forward during World War I thanks to the United States Navy and, among others, the United Fruit Company. All right, all right, what's that all about? Well, the U.S. has gotten into World War I. The Navy makes the successful argument that radio is a strategic asset. So all the patent holders, all the folks who are at the cutting edge of this emerging technology were brought together by the Navy so that they could have better radios than our enemies and hopefully help us win the war. Among those who were in this original, oh, consortium, I guess you would call it. General Electric? That eh, makes sense. Uh, defense contractor, consumer products maker. AT&T, the phone company. Eh, yeah, of course. Westinghouse? They had the top research and development laboratory in the nation at that time. And the United Fruit Company. Uh, that's the company that, among other things, uh, uh, imported uh, Chiquita bananas for so many years. And the United Fruit Company was in on this because they had an enormous fleet of ships coming from you know, Hawaii and Costa Rica and all the places where fruit comes from. After the war, the Navy couldn't maintain a monopoly over radio. That wouldn't make sense. And so it was spun off into something called the Radio Corporation of America, uh, known to most people as RCA. Well, what is the first commercial radio station? Well, that's, you know, kind of up to debate. But uh, to many, it is KDKA Pittsburgh, which went on the air in 1920 and is still on the AM dial today. And when we say it's a commercial station, you can take that as, as literally as you wish. Uh, in this case, a commercial station means it ran advertising. Nineteen twenty-seven, big year. Charles Lindbergh flies uh, uh, an airplane across the Atlantic Ocean for the first time. Uh, Babe Ruth hits sixty home runs, and also in that fateful year, uh, a company was formed that figured out how to make 
money off of radio broadcasting. You know, up until this time, all the little experimental stations that were out there almost inevitably lost money. Now, what the key to profitability was, was to take individual stations in different cities and put them together into a network. It began with 13 affiliate stations in 13 cities. And because they were splitting their programming costs 13 ways, and then as the network grew, 20, 50, and so forth, they could afford to make really professional sounding, high quality uh, radio programs, you know, much higher than their independent comp competition. Furthermore, furthermore, on the money side, they were able to draw national advertisers, uh, Ford Auto Light Car Parts, uh, Maxwell House Coffee, Pepsi and Toothpaste. Those were all early radio advertisers. This first radio network, the National Broadcasting Company. You know, even today, if you watch NBC or maybe one of its affiliate cable stations and they get to a station break, you will hear those three tones that mean NBC. Do, do, do. That is their radio logo. By the 1930s, entertainment radio was a part of middle-class American life. Radios had been designed to look like furniture, so they would fit into the living room. And furthermore, it became a part of the family's evening to listen to their favorite radio shows. And it seems like just about all of those types of programs that eventually made it over to television were originally on the radio. And were there radio dramas? Oh, absolutely, including detective dramas. Uh, radio situation comedies. Um, Lucille Ball, uh, long before uh, uh, she made I Love Lucy, uh, had a, a radio situation comedy called My Favorite Husband. Uh, variety shows. Uh, certainly people like uh, Burns and Allen and Jack Benny and others had shows with comedians and singers and other sorts of acts. Radio game shows, especially by the 1950s as some of the more popular dramas and comedies were moving toward television, radio game shows uh, were, were very, very popular. Radio westerns, uh, yeah, you know, you think what's a western without being able to actually see the big shootout on Main Street? Well, it relied a lot on sound effects. Radio soap operas. You know, you think of those creaky old radio soap operas where the theme is played over some organ or something. Yeah, those, those were popular. Now, in Great Britain, uh, 1939 was a really difficult year. They had entered World War II. By 1940, um, London was being bombed nightly. And yet, and yet, in that predicament, the UK went ahead with commercial television broadcasting. I guess there is something to that, you know, stay calm and carry on sort of attitude. In the United States, the decision was more cautious. You know, as, as many of you are aware, the U.S. didn't get into the Second World War until December 7, 1941. Well, as the U.S. was pulled into the Second World War, the three biggest radio networks, NBC, you know, the first network, uh, a competitor that they got the next year, 1928, the Columbia Broadcasting System, or CBS, and then a third network that had been created by a uh, Supreme Court decision in 1943, uh, the American Broadcasting Company. 
those three big radio networks had the entire Second World War to think about what will be uh, our approach toward television. And what really the strategy was, beginning by about, oh, 1947, was for the radio networks to take a few of their most successful shows, like the George Burns and Gracie Allen uh, variety show, which had been such a big hit on NBC radio, and to slowly transition that and a few other top shows each year over to television. By the end of the 1950s, pretty much all the consequential radio entertainment programming had been moved over to television. Now, what you may not realize, what you may not realize, is that to this day, uh, the networks, the broadcast networks, have stayed in radio news. If you don't believe me, at noon today, tune in to KNX. 1070 AM here in Los Angeles, and you will hear uh, national and international news headlines from CBS Radio News. Well, I think I told you at the beginning of this that uh, this is a chapter that you know kind of goes back and forth. So we're now going to talk a little bit more about the recording business. Uh, Ralph Hansen has made the case, and I gotta say, I, I agree with him, that the recording business uh, had a modest but real effect on the movement toward racial integration in America in the 1950s and 60s. For example, in the post-World War II years, jazz and rhythm and blues. Historically, uh, African-American genres of music also had some white fans who had come into contact with the music, maybe by listening to, uh, to records. And uh, what that did on a, um, a, a, a basis more of integration is that you began to see a few white fans in Los Angeles, for example, uh, begin to to try to go to to uh, uh, some of the African American music clubs on Central Avenue. By the 1950s, you had uh, African American artists like uh, Lena Horne or Scatman Carruthers uh, beginning to play uh, uh, on the on the white side of town. Um, just as a personal aside, in the uh, mid-1950s, my, my parents went to see uh, Scatman Carruthers at the Coconut Grove, mid-Wilshire, what today would be the heart of Koreatown. Elvis Presley, a white man, but who had grown up in America's uh, Southeast uh, with a exposure to African-American gospel music, uh, when Elvis Presley sung songs that were maybe first recorded by African-American artists, I'm not sure it was cultural appropriation. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Elvis Presley, growing up as a poor Southern white, uh, that, that music was uh, quite close to his heritage, too. So, all right. Uh, if you are hearing this uh, while you have access to, uh, to chat, it would be fun to, uh, to hear your ideas about examples of music shrinking the distance between cultures today. Well, music doesn't always sound the same to everyone. Uh, Music has always been controversial. A hundred years ago in the United States, uh, some believed that jazz, for example, was 
the devil's music. In the 1960s, some of the most popular rock and roll groups were accused of uh, promoting drug use and encouraging casual sex. By the 1990s, with the uh, Seattle grunge scene, there was a concern that uh, music was leading melancholy young people uh, uh, towards suicide. And rap, in its early years, had, had the reputation of uh, being hostile toward uh, uh, police officers. So, when a new type of music comes up or a controversial artist comes up, it is absolutely natural that some will have concerns over the effect of some lyrics on young people. And I think what's at the root of this is that different generations and different cultures hear different things in the same lyrics. I mean, you know, think about, for example, uh, a rap song that has perhaps been made by a singer-songwriter of color who is venting his concerns, his anger, his issues over unequal police treatment. And to that artist, it's a protest song. And he's giving voice to the issues that he and people like him uh, experience. Of course, to the person in a law enforcement family, uh, these same lyrics can sound terribly hostile. They can sound threatening. So, all right. Uh, as I sometimes tell my students, I'm, uh, I know far less about popular music than you do. Uh, to me, music is uh, a, a thing I mostly listen to in elevators. So please tell me what music controversies exist today. And if you have access to chat, I'd be very interested in, in hearing your examples. Atoms to Bits. This is a major theory in the course. It began some years ago with Dr. Nicholas Negroponte of the MIT Media Lab. And, oh, I think as far back as the 1990s, Dr. Negroponte was, uh, uh, had, had predicted that all media, they are destined to move from their physical form, which he calls atoms, to their digital form, which is bits. So, you know, think about the film business, where uh, most movie theaters show digital files. You know, they don't have big cans full of film on spools anymore. That would be an atoms to bits transition. In the world of music, it has become uh, just, it was just destined to evolve from big vinyl albums to little silvery CDs to downloads and streaming. So you tell me, what other mass media do you see going through an atoms to bits transition? Hit that chat if you got it now. This is uh, Dr. Negroponte, and this is a, a quote where he explains his atoms to bits theory. You know, as I look at this, um, as this is being uh, recorded, you know, I, I, I can't help but notice that him talking about uh, change is exponential, how small changes today can grow into huge changes tomorrow. Uh, in the wake of uh, COVID-19, I, I, I think we're seeing that power of exponential uh, growth. 
Now, for the music industry, the atoms to bits transition has been a difficult thing to adjust to. And surprisingly so, because uh, other innovations in recorded music had been very good for the, the music industry. For example, when, uh, when stereo came in in 1958, that was great for the music business. They, they just took all of their top stars and they re-recorded their albums in stereophonic format and they sold more records and people bought high-end stereo record players and you know, a lot more money was spent. But not with file sharing. Ah, the long tail. Remember, this, this course takes quite a look at the long tail. Um, you know, as became, I, I think, fairly uh, obvious in the book chapter, this is an interesting era for content creators. And in that chapter, of course, I was talking about authors who can now self-publish. Now, in the music business, things have really changed. It used to be where uh, someone who wanted to have a record made, uh, a garage band, a beginning act, whatever you'd call them, they would have to catch the attention of an artist in repertoire, an A&R scout for a record company, and hope, just hope, that that A&R scout would be willing to sign that vocalist or that group to a contract. And in that contract, inevitably, the record company would have nearly all the power. Well, today there's other options. Today, an artist can truly be independent, can uh, build a, 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 maybe a local following, and then use uh, some of the, uh, of the streaming labels to get their music directly to their customers. Now that said, it doesn't mean that you know, Capitol Records or whoever is suddenly you know, completely irrelevant. Well, no. Uh, for those artists who really do want to be the next megastar, who really want to be part of the short head as opposed to the long tail. In other words, I mean someone who you know, sells music in, in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Uh, to this day, nothing surpasses the large record labels for just pure star-making power. As for terrestrial radio, what I mean by that is AM and FM, it's hanging in there, but it has more competition than it has ever faced before. All right, this is a big transition in the chapter. Um, we are now going to move over to the radio side of things. I think we, uh, we did a good job with, uh, with recording, so let's now do radio. Radio stations, especially in big markets, meaning big cities like where we live, uh, radio stations typically have formats, and that is they specialize in a style of programming. So if a radio station has a consistent format, a consistent style of programming, in a crowded radio dial, that station can help find a loyal audience. I mean, if you're always playing big band music or something like that, well then, presumably, all the fans of that type of music will consistently visit your station. Furthermore, people who like a certain type of programming usually have other demographics uh, in common. You know, think about uh, uh, sports talk radio. It tends to be males of a certain age and you know, that leads to certain advertisers who would say oh you know uh, we want to sell car insurance or we want to sell 
I don't know, um, um, remedies for male pattern baldness. Well, you know, you, you can then find as an advertiser a radio station that has a listenership that, uh, that is a lot like your target customer. So what are these formats? Well, as of 2018, the top format in the country was some variation of country music. Now, you say, well, what's new country? Well, new country is kind of country rock crossover. And why that makes sense from an economic point of view is that pure country has kind of an aging audience. So new country makes the audience a little younger, which advertisers like. And it plays well in some of the outer suburbs. So you know, that broadens it, its appeal. The second most popular radio format is news and talk radio. So there's a, there's a considerable audience for non-music programming. Uh, years ago, I used to take my classes to one of our all-news radio stations in town, and I was told that the core audience for news radio is predominantly male, predominantly over 35, above average education, above average income. As for talk radio, I find it kind of interesting how uh, liberal left progressive talk has been tried on the radio but it hasn't been particularly successful. Conservatives, you know, they, they just seem to rule uh, the world of talk radio. But you know the funny thing is, if you go to the movie theater and you see movie documentaries, it's the other way around. The liberal left progressive types seem to rule um, movie documentaries for whatever reason third type of radio format, third most popular in the U.S., is what's called adult contemporary. Now, this is uh, a station which has a type of station that plays music for an audience, oh, 25 to 49, kind of right in the prime of life. Pop contemporary uh, aims at a younger audience uh, from middle school up into the early 20s. Pop contemporary is oftentimes a very, very simple playlist. You take whatever is at the top of the pop charts this week and you play those songs in tight rotation. When the charts change next week, you play those songs. Classic rock, that is a uh, uh, reaching a uh, aging audience, uh, probably the fading uh, boomer population. Spanish language radio. Well, as of uh, five years ago, as of 2015, uh, there were more than 500 stations in the United States uh, broadcasting in Spanish. Uh, by and large, these stations were hit pretty hard by the Great Recession. And in big markets that have a lot of Spanish speakers, such as you know, the greater Los Angeles area, uh, you don't just have Spanish language radio stations, you have Spanish language radio stations in various formats, just like you have um, on the English language side. By the way, you, you may wonder who, who these fellows are here. I think you have to be a, a, a Dodger fan to, to recognize them. Uh, this is Jaime Harin, who has been uh, announcing Dodger games uh, for, oh gosh, I think 60 years now. And former Dodger pitching great, now his broadcasting sidekick, uh, Fernando Valenzuela. Uh, let's get on to talk radio. Talk radio uh, uh, has several very powerful syndicated personalities. 
And what that means is, is that various stations across the country will buy their programs. So, you know, someone like Sean Hannity, uh, instead of just being popular on a local level, he has a national audience of, of millions. Uh, also, uh, quite influential and high paid <laughs> in, in the world of radio are the syndicated uh, disc jockeys. Now, usually your top radio entertainers will have their shows on during drive time. Drive time, note. Uh, radio is, is very tied in with automobile use in the United States. So prime time in radio is those hours when more people are in their cars. So morning drive time is approximately 6 to 9 a.m. and afternoon drive time is approximately 4 to 7 p.m. Um, these top syndicated radio personalities, they are the superstars of radio. And a big part of their worth is not only that they attract big audiences, but those audiences keep coming back year after year. The 1996 Telecommunications Act allowed wealthy individuals and corporations to buy up a vast number of radio stations. Clear Channel Communication uh, was the largest owner of radio stations in the early 2000s. I mean, when you think about it, owning over 1,200 stations in the United States, that's just mind-boggling. Now, as of a couple of years ago, Clear Channel did something that I thought was a wise move. They became iHeart Media, and it was more than a name change. They uh, they sold off some of their weaker stations to help fund uh, a presence in streamed music. And I remember thinking, you know, gee, uh, iHeartMedia sounds like a good idea because, you know, whichever way uh, radio goes, whether it, you know, continues in broadcasting or it goes more and more to streaming, then iHeartMedia has a foot in both camps. But as of 2018, iHeartMedia filed for bankruptcy protection. Please note, when a company files for bankruptcy protection, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going out of business. It just means that they need extra time to pay their debts. Now, this consolidation of radio stations that began back there with the Telecommunications Act of 1996 uh, some critics say that that has ushered in the era of corporate radio and that, for example, um, a pop contemporary station in Los Angeles sounds a whole lot like a pop contemporary radio station in Cincinnati, Ohio, or Atlanta, Georgia, that, that they just sound pretty much alike. NPR. Well, I think by this point in the semester, you know that I'm rather fond of M NPR. So, might as well tell you where it comes from and what its issues are. NPR was founded in 1967 during the Great Society era. Lyndon Johnson was president. The country was prosperous. And President Johnson had a strong Democratic majority in Congress. And so, under the Great Society program, uh, a, a series of programs were, were passed designed to enhance the quality of life of average Americans. Now, many of those Great Society uh, uh, programs have fallen by the wayside, but two that have survived are PBS, the public broadcasting system on television, and National Public Radio, NPR. PBS 
never has been quite a huge player in the world of television. But NPR is legitimately a giant on the radio, particularly its uh, morning edition, morning drive time news program, and it's all things considered uh, uh, afternoon drive time uh, news program. They have vast national audiences. Now, this is going to sound a little picky, but it's, I think it's important. Uh, NPR no longer refers to itself as national public radio. And you say, well, gee, you know, what's so bad about any of those words? They seem fine to me. Well, what it is, is that NPR is trying to di diversify beyond traditional radio. Uh, you can get NPR podcasts, you can get NPR streaming, and so, yes, they, they, they don't want to be thought of as being just about radio anymore. On to the future of sound. Well, first, you may think that the world of AM and FM radio is sort of te technologically static. It isn't. The big new thing on the AM and FM front, although I hesitate to call it new because it's been on the horizon for a number of years, is high definition radio. And that is turning the broadcast waves from analog to digital. And it makes the radio sound better. Uh, it is said that AM signals in HD sound as good as FM. And FM signals broadcast in HD sound about as good as satellite. You say, oh, that's good. Now, the federal government wants this changeover to happen because, and I'm oversimplifying here, but analog signals are fat and digital uh, broadcast signals are skinny. And the FCC wants radio to take up as little of the broadcast spectrum as possible because you know, all the mobile devices that we use, you know, our, our, our smartphones, are using up more and more of the broadcast spectrum. Well, the, the problem here, the reason why HD hasn't just completely revolutionized radio, is that for this all to work, consumers need to have another radio. So that AM, FM radio in your car, well, it doesn't get HD signals. Now, the car makers have uh, uh, put HD in some cars, but there's not a lot of interest. You know, when, when I say interest has been tepid, that means eh. Let's look a little more at the future of sound. Recorded music sales went into about a 15 year long slump and it was an unprecedented rough stretch uh, uh, for the recording companies. Finally, uh, sales of recorded music began to increase beginning in 2016. Um, to a degree that you may not realize, music subscription services are the backbone of how uh, music makes money today. Look at this, almost two-thirds of revenue. There are still a few people who are buying you know, physical forms of music, CDs and vinyl and whatnot. Well, they're about one-sixth of of music sales. Digital downloads, not quite what they once were, but still uh, bringing in 15% of the money, so that's got to be something. Uh, we can't get through the future of sound without talking about satellite radio. Satellite radio uh, started in Canada. Uh, right around 1999 and I can remember at that time thinking 
wow, satellite radio is going to be a really big thing. And I wasn't the only one who thought that. Uh, originally, there were two separate satellite radio companies in the U.S., Sirius and XM. And the, the thought back then, and, and I agreed with this, was that just as most families in those days were paying for cable television so they could get more choice and better quality, then all those people who are in their cars for a lot of hours, the, the thinking went, would subscribe to satellite because they'd get more stations and higher quality. Well, it didn't work out that way. First, the tech bubble burst in the stock market in 2001, which led to a recession. And then there was the Great Recession, which began in 2008. And then there were a lot of ways that people could get their programming for free, like free streaming or podcasts or, or, or whatnot. That has really reduced the market for satellite radio. And in the midst of this, the two separate companies, XM and Sirius, merged. And by 2017, that merged company, maybe it wasn't as big as originally envisioned, but at least it was profitable. Certainly, your digital devices, your smartphones, are where the action is for so many things related to mass media. And streamed audio is is really what uh, both the recording business and the radio business are coming to. I mean, when you think about why Ralph Hansen put these two seemingly different uh, forms of mass media into the same chapter, maybe what he was thinking about was that it was coming toward this convergence. And I, I think that um, evidence that uh, streamed audio has come of age is that now people are using their mobile devices for radio or recorded music type entertainment in their cars. I did a media note uh, a few years ago about Ford, uh, the automaker, was thinking, gee, Maybe we won't put radios in our cars in the future. Maybe we will just put in speakers and uh, USB ports. I'm a fan of the humble MP3. Uh, I know, you say, gosh, MP3s are everywhere. Anyone can make one. Uh, you know, I could... I could download thousands of MP3s for free, you know, anytime I want. And I'd say, exactly, exactly. That's why it is such a successful format. And perhaps because pretty much anyone can make an MP3, podcasts are a particularly long tail friendly form of audio. What do, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is audio programming that would be too specialized for even the smallest radio station makes sense in podcast format. I mean, I remember running into a podcast uh, a few years ago that was just for bicycle couriers in San Francisco. I mean, you can't get much more specialized than that. Furthermore, I take podcasts and the humble MP3 seriously because they're new media. You know, the, the, those new media features, hallmarks, are, are there with podcasts. The, the consumer gets exactly the kind of programming they want. They can listen to it in the order they want. And they can listen to it whenever they want.